sad to say the tricks you played on me everything you had you pushed away my one regret is that you never know the truth you keep the words you speak you think never shows but you show me who you are each day it's sad it has to come down to this oh war who are you fighting for divide what's already ripped away my only wish was for you to play How it's gonna be Say goodbye, no tears, no regrets This is how it's gonna be Say goodbye, no tears, no regrets This is how it's gonna be The American dream? <laughs> the little car in every garage is probably really the, the American dream. But I think really uh, having a, a, a comfortable uh, roof over your head for me, the idea would be to, uh, no matter where I am in terms of my, my station in life, is, is to have some choices. I, I think the American dream to me, uh, in many ways as a black man, has been more of a nightmare than a dream. You know, of course the American dream is supposed to be to have your house with your picket fence. Own your own home, drive a nice car, be able to send your kids to college, you know, and have money in the bank for retirement. So that's what I feel the American dream is. Oh, you can stand alone, Monday. In the early years of Oregon black history, there was a serious political and social and cultural attempt simply to exclude blacks from residence in the area in any form, uh, whether they were slave or free. And this was typical of the pioneer generation. And, uh, it was reflected in a series of black exclusion laws that were adopted by the legislature and originally included in uh, the first Oregon Constitution. The, uh, the lesson, the message was clear, and the message was that Oregon was not a place that blacks were going to be welcome. As we move deeper into the 20th century, and the black population increased, uh, very specific decisions were made about where those blacks would be allowed to live. And the Albina district, uh, its close association with the older traditional black community, was an area determined for black settlement. Uh, later migration and natural increase really identified it in the 1950s and 60s as the black uh, area of, of residence in Portland, and really the only black residential area in the state of Oregon. When I grew up uh, in this area in the 50s, it was called Union Avenue. It was a thriving street, thriving street. Just all kinds of fantastic things on MLK. But as the demographics changed and as the black population moved in, there was less and less investment and less and less uh, opportunity. When you'd ask, you know, uh, are you looking at investing in North? The North, he said, well, it's not a good time. And so it died. literally when the gang scare happened, that sort of led to kind of a wholesale panic and an abandonment of the market. And by the early 90s, in four or five neighborhoods in inner North or East Portland, you had 2,000 homes that the county owned, which basically means that it wasn't worth $5,000 in taxes to keep hold of a home. Landlords simply walked away from them rather than pay the back taxes and be saddled with a property that wasn't worth it. The property values were so diminished that a home that maybe the family had paid 40000 for, they didn't think they could get twenty-five or thirty. 
It was 1990, and a reporter named D. Lane wrote a four-part series in the Oregonian called Blueprint for a Slum. It basically proved that the banks had redlined Northeast Portland, and it then went on to explore in the subsequent articles what happens when a bank redlines a neighborhood. detailed a story of a couple that had a hundred thousand dollars line of credit pre-approved from from a bank went and made an offer on an eighteen thousand eighteen thousand dollar two thousand square foot victorian in northeast and the bank declined they then took their hundred thousand dollar line of credit and bought a house in lake oswego where you could still go for a hundred thousand then so it was pretty dramatic i mean really that was the moment where the whole city kind of got the real estate problem <laughs> my name is Nikki Williams. I'm 28 years old and we're sitting in the kitchen of my brand new home. Um, it was built by Habitat for Humanity. This is my daughter. Um, Ariana. Yeah. Um, I do all my own framing and matting. I'm a homebody. When I first um, applied to become a Habitat homeowner, I lived on the corner of 9th and Killingsworth and that is like not the place to be. Lots of drugs, lots of prostitution. You know, before I'd let my daughter go outside and play, I had to go out and clear all the needles out the yard. Um, I think I was making less than 1200 a month, including benefits and everything. Trying to raise a 10-year-old on that. Come on, Moo. Um, coming upstairs. I'm a busy body. Yeah. This is my room. She did all the handprints. It's kind of hot in here, isn't it? I've been here exactly four months. How's it been? Um, uh, well, the house is great. <laughs> um, however, um, this particular street um, is a really crime infested street. There's three houses I can think of on this block that are known drug houses. I see it every day. Here's the bathroom. Because I have a boyfriend who stays here, Habitat graciously divided the bathroom in two. So if he's in the shower or in the tub, she can still come in and wash up. My daughter was sitting in her window one day and saw a fight between a boyfriend and girlfriend where the boyfriend hit his eight months pregnant girlfriend in the stomach with a baseball bat. And then she in turn turned around and ran him over with her car and no one called the police, no one called the ambulance. Um, I am involved in Neighborhood Watch. I am involved in Neighborhood Association. Um, I am trying to make a difference, but unfortunately I have been targeted um, because I call the police, something's wrong with me. That is really what kind of scares me and angers me, um, how this has been so normalized. Are you gonna clean up this neighborhood single-handed? If I have to. I've worked too hard. Um, to provide a decent environment for my child. So if it takes me being a one woman cleanup crew, then I'll, I'll do it. Here's my bedroom. Uh, I did all the pain. I was feeling kind of fuchsia that day. <laughs> yeah. And that's basically other than the backyard. That's the house. Don't blast that music on her. <laughs> When I first decided I was going to start cleaning up this street, I was not afraid. I, I mean, despite the threats and the um, confrontations, um, I never feared for my safety or anything like that. However, about two weeks ago, that changed. I had left my daughter here while I went out on errands and um, the neighbors didn't know that someone was home. And so she was sitting in her window and she overheard them talking about how they were going to break in the house. and if we were here, they were gonna do this and do that to take care of us. When I came home, she told me that and I, mean, I got sick to my stomach. Um, up until then, I, had, I did not fear. Um, but that's when it changed. But the fear turned to anger 
And for me, anger has always been my motivator. <laughs> and so I just really got on the ball. You know, I stepped up calling the police every time I saw a drug transaction, every time I saw something happen. Um, I stepped up the letters, you know, um, not just to the property owners, but to the police, to the mayor, to the people that need to take care of it, made calls to Section 8 Housing Authority, you know. Um, so I took my fear and anger and I made it into a positive thing. Um, but at this point, do I fear for my safety? No, I don't fear for my safety. I fear for my daughter's sanity. You know, um, it's really taking a toll on her. She's afraid for me. So yeah, I'm starting to kind of worry a little. What is gentrification? Gentrification to me is where there is an absolute plan, uh, process to displace people. Traditionally it's been uh, African American families getting moved out and white families move in. Gentrification is the, uh, the influx of needed, needed money and capital and people. I would define it as another word for a <laughs> discriminatory action. No matter what the real definition is, they assume that it means, you know, gold diggers coming in, finding some cheap housing, fixing it up, chasing out the people that have been there forever. It's pretty simple. It's, it comes from gentry, which was the landed gentry, which were those people who own land. It's just that simple. You own land, you're the gentry. Gentrification? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we want the right person to get it. Uh, what do you, what do you feel that that might be happening here? It is there? happening here. It is happening here. Yeah. You'll see it. You own land, you're the gentry, which means as soon as you buy it, you've gentrified it because you now own it and you're going to live in it. And the first time you fix it up because the banker says they'll loan you more money, you add a little value to it. And every time you do that, you make not only your house worth more, but the house next door is worth a little bit more too now just because it's all in the same spot. Um, and that's how gentrification happens. <laughs> in the 80s, Northeast plummeted so far below what it should have been at and that in the 90s when, when the growth came and some attention was paid to redlining and other issues that, that were discriminating against this neighborhood the, the houses shot up like crazy. Companies that moved in uh, and, and looked for good buys and uh, the best buys were in, in the northeast. If the renters the house is being sold off from underneath them if their owners and they've been there a while they're, they're being encouraged to sell because it's a return they get some money on it, but the, but the new buyers are, are not buying from the owners. They're buying from a middle man who's buying it, doing some stuff, and then jacking it up and, and seeing what the market will carry. Gentrification, but, but it's not caused by what's called in language an incumbent upgrading. It's not an upgrading based upon new buyers coming in and upgrading the neighborhood. It's really based being pushed by market forces and speculation, which is really pushing people out. A lot of uh, minority families who live in this neighborhood for years and poor families that can't afford to live in this area are going to buy by. I've been here for a little over a year. The rent is 600 but I'm on Section 8 and they cover most of the cost except for $47. My lease is up uh, January 15th. And after that, I have to have a place else to live beside here. I would like to stay in this area because this is where I grew up, but it's getting more expensive and, you know, more harder to rent. I don't know. I know if I do stay in this neighborhood, it's going to be hard finding a place. It's going to be really hard. No, I don't believe it's a deliberate attempt to displace the black population. Uh, I think that that displacement has been a byproduct of some other powerful uh, factors that have come into play in, in Portland life. Gentrification is an absolutely logical and a reasonable economic uh, concept to occur. But when you tie it to our racial history, then it's, that's when you begin to see the difficulties that begin to emerge from it. Is there any good effect? It is if the rest of the community buys into it, but if it's just like 
you know, white people do this here and black people do this here and there's no joining, then that's not good. The Barbara Mayer Building, um, where I'm case manager, is a city-funded program. It's an all-female, alcohol and drug-free housing community. Um, we house 32 women, and most of my women come from treatment. I say about 95% of the women who live here were referred to treatment programs. I don't take self-referrals. Well, we've been here since six something this morning, and the way we do it is me and October, the building manager, we go from floor to floor knocking on the doors, banging on the doors, actually saying really, really loud, UA time, UA time, and they're mandatory. Well, I take them one by one and do UAs on them. Sometimes people put false urine in their vaginas. This is the fun part. Oh yeah. Actually, the dope building hasn't gotten any better. Um, there's actually like a kind of a sting going on. We have been given a set of binoculars by the police. <laughs> we have been given a ton of forms you know, to start the official sting. And this is what will lead to the affidavit, which will lead to the actual police coming at five in the morning, kicking down the door. From the looks of things, everything's negative, but the math that I'm hoping like that, that changes. You guys just don't know, I really don't feel like dealing with this shit today. <laughs> Bummed is because this is someone, if this does test positive again, this is someone who have really been doing good. Um, on the verge of getting their child back. Um, and when I test, when I catch someone testing positive, there's usually lots of tears and lots of blaming, and it's really not a pretty sight. It really kind of ruins my day. You know, when I come out of one of those meetings, I'm like emotionally and mentally drained, usually. Yeah, so imagine dealing with this all day, and then the minute you get home, you know, you're dealing with a dope house next door. It gets tired, you know, it gets tired real fast. So it was at that time, 89, 90, 91, that we began to develop a strategy to get us out of this. The, the formation of the community development um, corporation movement is long before my time, but I think a lot of activists began to say, we need a new model for how to take on these issues, and the Community Development Corporation grew out of that. If you go back in the history of government funding, the federal government has tried basically paying the private sector to house low-income people. That's worked for a limited amount of time, but it's very expensive. You find out quickly if you put all the low-income housing in one place, low-income people in and of themselves are good people. If you concentrate all the poverty in one building, it doesn't work. One of the things that, that began to develop probably 25 years ago was a theory that if you could build community-based nonprofits that were technically very strong, who had the real estate skills and the organizing skills to own property, that over the long run, those groups owning the real estate and tying that to organizations that, that wanted to work on the big picture could really start to be a long-term viable solution. The commitment in the city and county giving the, the tax for closed properties and making these operating grants to the CDC said, we want you and your neighborhoods to be part of this revitalization. We don't have the answers. We want a, a true partnership. And again, there's so much rhetoric around partnerships and community involvement, all these buzzwords, but usually it doesn't happen. Usually government doesn't relinquish control. And we did. You know, you talk about gentrification now, and if you have a thousand homes that are vacant with, you know, drug dealers breaking in, um, people scared to go out at night, not enough eyes on the street, you need some amount of, quote, gentrification. You need people to move in and live in those houses. Now, just five or six years later, we're at the complete opposite end of the spectrum, and a vacant house can cost as much as $80,000 and still need $75,000 worth of work. What started as a movement to fix up abandoned housing and do it in a way that was cost effective and provide people a decent way to live moved over time into sort of a, a, a I wouldn't go so far as desperate, but almost a desperate move to 
try and keep places that are affordable in a neighborhood that people are accustomed to living in. The meeting we're at tonight is called Hope and Hard Work. It's a community-based organization with um, the homeowners, renters, the police come faithfully, the mayor sometimes comes, and different organizations involved in trying to clean up the streets. Um, the city, buildings and bureau people come for like problem properties that need to be cleaned up, torn down, or gotten rid of. So we're in the process of doing introductions right now, but you're more than welcome to come in and kind of observe. He was a black gang detail. Both of these guys are working black gangs. Um, but anyway, several problem addresses in that area. A gang enforcement team combined, and I believe, circled the entry on house. Um, in doing so, they came up with not quite an ounce of marijuana, but they kept with marijuana and no other drugs. At 3424? 3424, yeah. Right next door to you. Yeah, marijuana? That's what they came up with that night. That's a personal thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that house should be shut down for a while. Um, you, you're there. You'll know better. We will. I don't know basically what your train of thought is on that, but I can tell you one thing: is if we could catch 200 people in that house, we would. Very significant. But it sends a message to the rest of the people there that uh, we can reach out and touch it, and we start touching people in there. So you will be next. Crack addicted baby. Crack addicted girl. How do you know? I mean, no. my mom told me last night, she said, oh, she had her baby. I said, oh, is it healthy? <laughs> she claims it's healthy. I find that hard to believe. She was like nine months pregnant and looked about three months pregnant. So I doubt if that baby's healthy. I really doubt that. But well, whose is this one? <laughs> <laughs> it ain't mine. It ain't that. Oh, I'm going to get paid. <laughs> it ain't mine. Honey, oh, so you deny me? You trying that Mary Joseph shit. Me. I don't believe it. I was drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all wrong. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> just simply get on Speaking of the street, I want to talk about the street. I tell you, we clink. She's out of here. The crack house next door. Her last day was supposed to be 31st, so she's out of here. The broad across the yep. street, she's gone. Um, she the blue money. house has been busted twice. So out of the four houses that were a problem, the city has actually not closed down, but evicted two of the tenants, shut down one, and they're working on the fourth. So remember you said was that one woman power? You're becoming one. I know. Pretty much. Oh, this is the no house next door to our home on uh, we live at 3428 and this is 3424. This was a revolving door. 24 hour crack house over here. This is the aftermath. Aftermath. This is it. So hopefully we'll get the next set of neighbors that'll be kind of decent here. Yeah. Um, the Gray House across the street, Problem House, that uh, has a lot of gangbangers in the summer and the spring. The Blue House here on the corner is another house that they've busted two times and found marijuana and guns. But that's the next. That's the next two houses on the agenda as far as cleaning up around here. Housing Our Families' mission is to provide affordable housing, empower uh, women to create community. I've been part of the Boys and Neighborhood Association for about eight months now, and the things I have seen in the last eight months, part of the BNA, we do weekly foot patrols, and we go out in the area and canvas the community. Well, two of Housing Our Family properties is part of that area, the Betty Campbell Building and the Maya Angelos. And there has always, and I'm not over exaggerating or being very general, there has always been lots and lots of drug problems and activities at both of these sites. We approached Taz and our families in May uh, to do a turnkey project with them. We would uh, design, finance, build, uh, 
10 units and um, has in our families would become the owner. So Tom Walsh may have come to us uh, in part to get the low interest loans, but he also came to us uh, really in good faith about affordable housing. The city approved some money to Tom Walsh and company with Housing Our Families to build nine affordable rentals. And at some point, the Neighborhood Association, uh, I think they didn't, you know, heard about it and then was mad that they weren't consulted and didn't like the project. And me being the housing commissioner, they called here and said, you know, what about this? What's going on here? Um, went to a BNA meeting and found out that it's going to be a 10 plex um, managed by Housing Our Families instantly made the hair on the back of my neck raise. Because like I said, Housing Our Family owns the two properties that have been such a problem in the past. The position of the Boise Neighborhood Association is that they want Housing Our Families to clean up their act. We feel very strongly that if they cannot control the properties they are currently using, they must not be allowed to control any further properties. That new proposed project on Kirby is part of this backstreet loop. So that is going to be part of my problem. You know, I didn't spend the last nine months going through pure hell, getting death threats, trying to clean this stuff up to have it brought back under a, a different guise. I think Barbara said that, in simple terms, the neighbors are mad at us and they're going to oppose the project. My first reaction to that was that the Neighborhood Association was probably opposing rental housing, uh, primarily, and then secondarily opposing city-funded, subsidized rental housing. I'm not anti-rental. I'm anti-housing our family managing it. Pretty quickly, I heard some other things that the neighbors were objecting to the way housing our families was managing property, and was really surprised to hear that. A good neighborhood agreement is, is, is a list of, of sort of actions on both sides that typically a neighborhood association and an owner or manager of a piece of property agree to and it, you know, standards for management, communication channels, expectations of each other. It's not legally binding, but the city pays great attention to them if they're actually in place. Okay, you got my coat. Can everybody start to get back to where you're going to sit? We're going to go ahead and start. I know, I just have a table. Could, could you, the folks from Hop, talk about the problems that you heard expressed at the last meeting, then to also include what you've done between the last meeting now to start to address some of that. Um, we are being blamed for the um, drug people in our area. Well, I want to tell you that it was much, 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 much worse. We have cleared up almost, I would say, 75%. I went by uh, Hop two times today, 130. Three drug dealers right in the entryway. On the way home, 5.30, three drug dealers across the street. I would ask you people, like I do, like I know all of these other people, get up off of the computer, go out, and ask them to go away, or ask this gentleman right there, who will be there in a minute. You, you ask, what does it look like? It looks like no more drug well, dealing right. out of the Betty Campbell. We have, Ever since the Betty opened, we've been saying they're dealing drugs right out the window. And this is going to sound lame for a minute here, okay? But look, what I'm hearing here is you're seeing stuff going on outside of our building that we are not seeing because we've got outreach staff that sit in the, at their desk and they call the police all the time. The, the problem is when an area gets identified as a drug area, uh, <laughs> you can take the drug dealers out of there, then other drug dealers will come in and take their place. There is also a grant around safe neighborhoods that we had put in a proposal to for better lighting at the Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. and that actually was approved today. And that's better money. We said every time when that's better money, we said new organization is not ready to receive that money because we have too many complaints against it, and we're protesting that. So you need to talk a little nicer to us with your attitude, man. We need to get behind the attitudes. Mm -hmm. This is very serious business, and I take it very serious. We as neighbors need to get involved and help to clean up Mrs. Avenue like we did a long time ago. Mr. Drugs ain't no one shared Mrs. And no one individual, Leonard Smith was there. No one person cleaned them up. We all cleaned them up. I just want to make this clear as loud as I can 
nothing will happen in this community and we continue to point fingers at the other person. We all must get involved in this cleanup. You know, I went to a neighborhood meeting and somebody said point blank, things have gone downhill at the Maya Angelou since Housing Our Families took over. And I said, oh, time out, folks. I mean, and I said, you know, when did you move into the neighborhood? And they said, well, a couple years ago. And I said, well, that was after Maya Angelou was taken over by Housing Our Families, so how do you know it was worse? Well, I, uh, you know, I just know it. Yeah, I said, and I kind of explained that what I just talked about, the history of that building, and I said, no, it's not worse. I mean, that place was, was dangerous literally to your person before, before Housing Our Families fixed it up. What I'm getting at is, you know, there's a perception that, that Housing Our Families is the cause of the problems, when in fact what's probably happening is at the current moment they're doing a less than perfect job of trying to address the problems. Are you working on... on a solution for the drug problem? There is not a solution for the drug problem. And basically what, what I'm being told is that all you do is scatter it and it moves from site to site to site to site. There has been a drug problem on this corner since dirt. The history is no excuse for those problems there now. I mean, Housing Our Families has got to figure out how to get their arms around those problems if they want to stay long-term viable, just like any business would. I had applied for her to get a four-year scholarship through the Children's Scholarship Fund, and I just got a letter the other day saying that she's been accepted. I don't think it's sunk in on her yet, but she realizes it is something special. Are you going to be going to a new school in the fall? No, I'm not. No? Yes, you are. I do not want to go to Holy Redeemer. She doesn't want to, but she's in. She's going to Holy Redeemer. I don't care what she wants. <laughs> I don't like that school. Yeah. Oh, Why don't you like that school? <laughs> Boring. She doesn't realize now, but this can be that door that, that can open to a whole nother life and lifestyle. So yeah, she's going. She doesn't want to, but she's going. <laughs> a lot of her friends, mothers had them when they were 12, 13, and 14. You know, so that's kind of being passed on. You know, their daughters are at that age where, you know, well, my mama did it. You know, not realizing, well, it's not normal to be graduated from eighth grade and eight months pregnant. Move! Yep. Ma, she all up in the view. They don't want to see her. So I want to get her out of here. You know, I would like to ship her away, not just for a day school, but ship her away. You know. I mean, maybe yanking her out of this environment isn't the best thing, but I, I, I have to at least know. You know, I have to know that. When living in the hood is an option instead of a life sentence, she'll thank me. Okay. problems that we have and how we all feel about it is to, to come under some sort of good neighbor agreement where you guys put a moratorium on your developments, your buildings, whatever thing you want to say for a given set of time so that we can see some real progress in the management. There are other projects I think that you have pending that you're not bringing to this board tonight. Well, can, can you say what those are, Leonard, what you're concerned about? Let them, they know. Okay. We need to get to answer the question. If you want to answer the question. Don't get to it. Don't get to it. This is the problem I'm asking okay, you. Okay, let's try to answer now. Listen to me. Okay. They haven't given me an answer. Right, you're, you're fussing, but there's a lot of people here with questions. I know, I know, I know, but I have one. Here's the question. And here's the question is, there's a lot to talk about. We can't talk about it all at once. Well, shouldn't we talk about Fargo? Yeah. You did come in late, but that has been the point I've been hearing. You're leading. You're leading. I'm talking about what you want to get. I was concerned was about what Pop needs to do with property. Right. Right. They already got. Okay. That's what we are. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, please. What I'm trying to figure out is what order do you want to talk about these things? I have heard two different things from neighbors here tonight. So what I'm trying to tell you is you're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with each other. Please stop interrupting me. If you haven't been. Yeah, that's why you get these I'm trying to find out what the first issue is. The Fargo Rule, if, we were, if it were for sale to, to individuals, affordable housing, we would have all been behind it because that would have said that housing our families wouldn't have been managing it. The individuals that owned it would be managing it. 
and hopefully they'll be self-managing and self-accountable. One of the saddest things to me is to see the tremendous backlash against renters. Um, I do believe when people own their property, they do take better care. I mean, you've got more at stake. You get to the displacement issue, uh, or migration, or whatever you want to call it, and the only, the only permanent way to get individuals to stay in a neighborhood is to get them to own part of it. Like this house right here, the owner lives in California. I don't think she's even seen this damn property in a couple of years, you know. Why is she really going to give a fuck? I mean, the front is overgrown with weeds, and I mean, big ass couch on the porch. I mean, <laughs> come on now. <laughs> Owning a home is our middle class welfare system. We get to write it off on our taxes. You consider that 50% of our population here rents. It's a, I mean, you're not just discriminating against a few, like the poor, you're discriminating against half of our folks. Opposition to rental housing doesn't carry a lot of weight with me. I think we need rental housing. It amazes me that there aren't more um, advocates for lower or affordable income people to have an equity stake in, in their future. There are several community development corporations that work on home ownership, but there are a zillion more people who will never qualify to ever get home ownership. Just because they're owned by CDCs or nonprofits, I mean, how many of those people live in the community? I mean, yeah, your heart is in the right place, but you're not the one having to take needles out your bushes. You're not the ones having to tell badass kids to get the hell off your porch. So how much of that really is a concern? If I were a renter, if I was a person who um, was in need of affordable housing, I would be pissed. Who gives you the right to tell me where I can live? Who gives you the right to say that my neighborhood will not thrive? if myself and people who are in my same position lived here and was moving and trying to build and make community, who, say, who gives you the right to make decisions about my livelihood? The minute how my family came in here, they brought the biggest problem back, which was bringing that shelter house, right? And they brought drugs in it. And I worked to clean it up. The real world is there are people who need homes. Okay, and because people need homes does not mean that they're criminals. Okay, and that pisses me off. Then all of a sudden, here's PDC to loan them some money. Give them the money, however they get it. They're giving them free money, man, and they're bringing the problem. I hate that. I'm sorry. No, I hate it. Gee, I'm mad. I know you are. I well, am pissed. Are you scared? For those who don't know, me and Jerome broke up. Um, it was coming. I think I had mentioned before that things had not been good. Um, personally, I think he had been back drinking for quite some time, and it was starting to show in his attitude. Um, but in March, he began trying to hit on me again, which is something I promised myself I would never go back to. When I first got with him, he would get drunk and fight a lot. But it all came to a head. Um, he came over drunk and jumped on me. Well, he just came over here drunk. He wanted acting to stupid. He act, acting stupid. He start mess with my mom. I'm a natural born fighter. Um, I used to scrap. Um, I have. I do have a criminal history for assault, so I know um, the alternative. Because four years ago, I was sitting in a jail cell for assault. And they actually hogtied me like a pig and drug me out my house half naked. Um, and it was that day, sitting in the jail cell, that I decided enough is enough. That was June 5th, 1994. So what I did, trying to be a mature adult, I went and got a restraining order. I was crying basically because I didn't, I thought we was going to go through what we went to a long time ago. I wasn't scared because I knew my mom would take care of it. I just thought I didn't want to happen what happened when I was like six or seven. What happened when you were six or seven? Everything bad. Um, the reason it is important for me um, to behave is because my daughter sees everything I do. And she has seen me flip out and fight. And so I'm trying to spend, and I will spend the rest of my life trying to erase those memories from her head. I don't ever want her to see her mother like that again. My mom said that it won't happen no more. Say goodbye, no tears, no regrets. This is how it's gonna be. 
say goodbye, no tears, no regrets. This is how it's going to be. The outcome from the last meeting was that folks from BNA leadership and Hoff people agreed to come together and try to take these property management issues and, and build a good neighbor agreement. We are getting a disproportionately large part of our housing stock or property taken up by uh, CDCs. And it's our feeling that we want to support our low-income neighbors, but we don't want to encourage a whole lot more. And what you're getting right now is the current list we work off of. And on this list is every single thing we've completed or have out there in the works. Two questions. One, what is withdrawn from project on Fargo Road? The Board of Housing Our Families had a long meeting last night and made the decision that we need to get our house in order and we have things that we want to do better and this project is more complex than we have the time to take on it and we have pulled out of the Fargo project. Good for you. We know how to be a grassroots organization and we, um, we just stepped away from it and the result was pretty Volatile, I guess I'd have to say. I'm not critical of Hoff. They've got to live with the Boise neighborhood for a long time. Uh, they've got some real issues right now that they got to discuss, and they don't need to develop property. I understand that totally. But if I never go through this same experience of spending a year on a project and have it fall apart because the nonprofit thinks they're not making enough money, uh, <laughs> once is plenty enough for that kind of experience. But it seems to me that the CDCs went wild for many years, and I don't, I don't mean wild in a negative connotation, but they grew enormously. Now it's, I think, time to take a step back, maybe take a breath, and uh, see if it's working. Well, CDCs have, um, have popped up everywhere, and, but most of them are run, for, run by people that came here from outside the community, you know, and a lot of them didn't even want to work with people in the community. Well, we know what's good for the community. And they came in and did what they wanted to do. Break it down, you can't have all these white folks moving in the ghetto who ain't got a goddamn clue about what it takes to straighten out a ghetto and pour tons of money in and think, oh, well, this is great. Look what we're doing, we're helping. Some of them have finally realized that, you know, you got to deal with folks in the community. We've got some experiences that you need to pay attention to. And there's been a lot of development. It, we've got quite a few CDCs in the neighborhood, and they're doing good work, you know. Um, they are making houses available to people who might not have been able to afford them in the past. So, you know, that's a positive thing. Um, yeah, that's a positive thing. I don't think the CDCs need to redefine what they do. I think they need to redefine how they do it in a new environment. But are you dealing with the issues that created this situation to begin with? Are you dealing with the drug addictions? Are you dealing with the not knowing how to be a parent? Are you dealing with the, you know, the, um, the molestations, the rape, the just depravity? You know, do you, are you dealing with those issues? If you wanted to say it quickly, they've gone from sort of the heroes of a revitalized neighborhood to the defenders of the poor. And that's a tough role. Ghetto is not about income level, it's about loss of hope. Are you, are you putting hope back in the community? Not just houses, are you putting hope in the community? And that is where I see a lot of the CDCs falling short. That's what I see. Are you scared? Aren't you sick of this? It's true you can become what you resist. the Good Neighbor Agreement and uh, um, for the Neighborhood Association as amended. I would second it and I, I particularly, I mean the, the opportunity here I hope is to move forward and not dwell on the last few months. Um, next I guess item is the land use policy. Marsha, you're up to bat. The gist of our land use policy says that the Boise Neighborhood Association 
favors home ownership, um, that we don't support any more rental housing that is subsidized for people whose incomes are lower than 60% of median family income. We're trying to get enough people in the neighborhood to who own their homes and have a vested interest in the neighborhood and who can support uh, the Mississippi corridor. I bought my house through a low-income program, the Northeast Community Development, and that's why we're just using this uh, economic level as a smoke screen, and we're not telling it like it is. Really? Well, here's, here's a way to go. I mean, I probably heard a lot of people feel it. Whether you guys who just came here and want to accept it or not, no income, bring all the problems we have, the crime, I'm sorry, the majority of the low income broke me on this corner. They don't spend no money with me, they don't spend no money with the other business. All they do is bring a problem to us, that's all, so we don't need all that. I want to go on record and say that Delaney's policy sounds quite racist, and I think it should be revisited. Well, whereas all whites dominate the board, it's very difficult for a person of color to have a motion. So I want to put that out. I think the implication that all poor people are black might be racist. Exactly, yeah. that's racist. I'd like to move that we adopt the land use policy as written. All seconded. I don't want to upset you domestic life. Well, uh, all, all, uh, first of all, there, there are still empty board seats that people could, could fill. I would just like to register uh, just a general offense and an objection to the kind of statement that all the white people are together. So and I'm that, I'm that, no. I'm Come on in. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> so all in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Three, four, five, six, seven, I think. If against, raise your hand. Four. Just the land I think policy. we just passed the land use policy. You're representing the community. You're no longer representing yourself. And you have to take that larger picture into account. What would the community want? We want housing. We want affordable housing. Whether that means you make $2 or whether that means you make $2 million, we want affordable housing. Income does not play a role in that. And I don't care what anybody says, it boils down to a racial issue. The very same houses that whites can come into the community and get, African Americans are redlined and can't get the loans from the banks. So I think that it's not something that, that we have to push under the, the, the table. We've done it too long. We have got to start somewhere and we have to start here in voice. We, we can't fight the Civil That's War again. Right. We can't do anything you know about the redlining that was and probably still going on. You can't do about that some people's going to get the money and some folks ain't. You can't do anything about that. So people in power, whoever they may be, black, white, whatever, have got to have empathy for a lot of other people in the community. And that's the closest you're going to come to it. But if we keep sitting here talking about what we have, we have and they did this to my grandparents yep. and what that, yep. hey, we'll be doing this for the next Ever, man. years. We bought down here, and now I've got to go. Yeah. 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 We have to work together. We don't, Ed, Ed, we don't have to talk about getting rid of one leadership or whatever the hell. We just sit here and chair the meetings. If you get it together in four months, you got it all set. If you don't. I still think they're okay people because, like I said, they got riled up about something and they did something about it. I still think that counts for a lot. Regardless of all the different points of view and different attitudes and just outright asinine behavior of some, <laughs> they were able to stick it out and stick it through. So I, I will forever be grateful for that. Call it gentrification, call it revitalization. <laughs> Obviously, there's an implicit point of view in both ways of stating it. No, because I, I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think revitalization has nothing to do with gentrification. Whether I do it or whether someone else does it, it's going to happen. Gentrification is actually desirable as long as you don't have displacement. It's, it's a colorblind issue. Economics is going to work the way it's going to work, and unfortunately, we, we need to empower people, poor people, low-income people, African-American people, to own their homes. And if they choose to sell them, if they choose to rent them out, they choose to rebuild them, that's their choice. The issue is, is that whether this, the city will, whether this area will maintain enough populace so that it is a diverse population. 
Say goodbye, no tears, no regrets This is how it's gonna be Say goodbye, no tears, no regrets This is how it's gonna be Say goodbye, no tears, no regrets This is how it's gonna be What is this documentary gonna be done? <laughs> Reverend Everett for the beautiful prayer. Affordable housing is frequently under fire across this nation. Community development corporations face many challenges, both in finding the necessary funding to build and properly manage properties and the not in my backyard syndrome. Housing our families has met many of those challenges in the last 12 months. And we are proud to be standing here before you this morning, presenting you with the Alberta Simmons Plaza. I think a lot of good things are happening in this neighborhood, um, and I think a lot of the some of the changes that have happened in this neighborhood in the last five or six years are just amazing. It's faster than anybody wants. Not much around here has changed. Yes, I've got these people out. Yes, I got those people out. If they fixed up every house on this block and put gardens in front and in back, you would still have nothing more than a street full of ignorant ass people. I hate to say that. I always say that slave mentality because to me that's what it is. You know, it's, it's a shackle of the mind. We're expected to act like this, so we need to act like this. You know, that's the kind of things I've been pondering. Okay, we've got rid of the dope houses as far as I know. How do we get rid of this bullshit ass mentality? You know, and I don't know how you do that. Sad to say, the tricks you played on me. Everything you had, you pushed away. Right now, we're seeing a lot of reaction from the neighborhoods against affordable housing. In the last 24 months, hundreds of people who've never been in Northeast have bought homes in Northeast, and, and, and we're going through that phase. You know, the reality of the Northeast area is that we can see it changing, but we, all, we can't predict exactly what that change is going to represent in the next generation. Um, so as far as identification, I still say let it come. Call it what you want, let it come, please. We don't exist well. Almost all neighborhoods are segregated by class in this country. And now you've got a situation in which you've got mixed income, but there's a lot of tension going on. As these houses go up in value, there's going to be a percentage of our citizens that's not going to be able to afford them. And we must help them. Let it come. I look forward to it. I've seen the rotten, ugly bottom part of the apple. I'd like to see the top part, the shiny, red, edible part, I guess you could say. I'd like to see that happen. And I've been told changes are coming. Let them come. Let them come. <laughs> this house a year ago. For me, the American dream was to be a homeowner. Nice house, nice car, um, job with status. Um, and I thought that would bring happiness. Nikki's version of the American dream, having people who love and respect you, having comfort, um, being comfortable. And hopefully, um, one day find a partner who values me and respects me? <laughs> what more can I ask for? Moving on to better things. Hope the next one can survive the sting. Oh, who are you fighting for? Divide. This is how it's gonna be. 
Say goodbye, no tears, no regrets. This is how it's gonna be. Say goodbye, no tears, no regrets. This is how it's gonna be.